please welcome to the stage Dr. Andre Dragan, Assistant Professor of Physics at University of Warsaw. Hello. I'm going to talk about the quantum theory, which is something I've been living with for the past two decades. And this is actually the best description of reality that we have. Uh, what I mean by that is that we can predict outcomes of measurements up to 10 digits of, sometimes even more, 10 digits of precision. Uh, in fact, people very uh, intensively try to find any experiment that would disagree with predictions of quantum theory, and for the past century, nobody succeeded with that. So we had not a single observation of reality that would go against prediction of quantum theory. It's really good theory. Uh, but then uh, when you try to teach it to students, uh, they get really confused. They don't like it. They, are, uh, they don't sometimes even believe it. So uh, the theory is quite easy to understand, but it's very difficult to accept. And let, just give you two, let me give you some examples. Um, in classical physics, when you try to predict something, you have lots of physics for that. They will predict what's going to happen in your experiment. In quantum theory, it's different because you can repeat the exact same experiment twice, and you will get two different outcomes. And you may think that, oh, it's because we are lacking certain precision or we don't know all the details of the experiments. For example, when I toss a coin, I can get heads or tails depending on how precise exactly I toss my coin. Well, it's different from quantum theory. It's not like the coin. Apparently, it's the fundamental randomness of reality. Even if you could uh, carry out the exactly ex uh, the same experiment twice, you still can get two different outcomes. We call this indeterminism. And people kind of protest against it, like how, how can it be? Uh, but that's, not, that, that's the beginning. So what happens if you don't make observations? Well, if you don't make observations, your quantum particles, like electrons or anything that matter is built of, uh, behave even more strangely. So electrons behave as if they were in multiple places at the same time. We call this quantum superposition. And you can run an experiment where things could happen in more than one way, and apparently the electron will behave as if it was doing both or more things at once. Quantum superposition. Uh, and there are other peculiarities of, of quantum theory. Uh, and when you teach it to students, they protest, then eventually they forget and they get used to this. That's how it works. Now, once in a while, they want to understand why is it. And uh, we reply, oh, this is what we know from experiments. This is what experiments tell us. For example, uh, um, experiments by John Clauser or uh, uh, Anton Seilinger or, or, um, or others shown that reality cannot be described in a deterministic way where you can predict everything. This is the Nobel Prize uh, for in physics for, from a few years behind. So, so this is something we, we know from experiments. But students still want to know why. And they keep asking, so we tell them, oh, this is fundamental law of physics. And let me tell you that when a physicist tells you that something is fundamental law of physics, it's a smart way of saying, I have no idea. Uh, so, so the question is why. And uh, the purpose of the talk today is to try to attempt to show you why things are, are the way they are. So uh, a couple of years ago, um, me and Arthur Eckert, who gave a, gave a beautiful talk yesterday, wrote a series of papers about the why. Why reality has to be random. Why reality has to be such that particles move along multiple paths at the same time. So we claim that uh, it is possible to explain this on a slightly more fundamental level and deduce it from simpler lo laws of physics. And uh, not even that. appears that uh, we can deduce it from something that we already know for 100 years, special relativity. So special relativity is a theory of Albert Einstein that characterizes uh, behaviors of space and time. You know, for example, that when you move very fast, your clock will slow down. In fact, all clocks will slow down, and we say that, well, it's because the time slows down when a uh, piece of uh, like object is moving uh, is sufficiently fast. And uh, there are different effects. Geometry can change when you in involve gravity. Time can even almost slow down to zero when you approach the event horizon of a black hole, stuff like this. But to me, this is not the most crazy part of in, in special relativity. This is just, of, of obviously, it's very um, intriguing, but there is something more shocking in special relativity to me. So it deals with space and time, and we intuitively feel that these concepts are completely different. Space and time are 
completely different quantities. And yet, relativity tells us that they are almost the same. In fact, relativity tells us that time and space only differ by a minus sign in one of the equations. And perhaps if you could remove that minus sign, if you could modify laws of physics, time and space would be exactly the same, and we would live in a universe where there is no time at all, but there's four dimensions of space. So that's really weird. And if relativity tries to explain what does it mean to move, for example, I'm moving right now, that means that my time and my space is different than what you call time and what you call space. And uh, this is depicted on these diagrams in special relativity, when what you call time is represented by the a vertical axis, what you call space is the horizontal axis, and what I call time is the yellow axis that is tilted. And this is my space. So the faster I move, the more my axis tilt, and if I could approach the speed of light, those two axes would actually almost touch each other. Uh, that's why you cannot achieve the speed of light, because that would involve situations where time and space merge. We don't know what that means. So uh, the thing is that you also cannot move faster than light. It's well known, because that would lead to certain causal paradoxes. For example, cause could be, after the, uh, cause could be before the effect, and probably you could run in some uh, situations where you could signal backwards in time. We don't know what it means. People usually discard such an eventuality. So me and Arthur ventured into the quest of trying to ask, OK, but what if? What reality would look like if we somehow were able to go to frames of reference that move faster than light? And apparently, the geometric theory is already there. You can extend relativity to answer this question. And funny enough, that would correspond to situations where the moving observer would have his time axis here and his space axis here. So they kind of cross each other. And the faster you move, the more you approach the situation where time and space is simply replaced. And for the observer that moves infinitely fast, mathematically speaking at least, that would correspond to situations where time and space are replaced. And the question is, how bad would that be? How terrible causal structures of the universe would uh, result from this? And what we have found, to our surprise, is that we would not end in hardcore paradoxes and self-contradictions that logically remove such possibility. But instead, what we have found is that, indeed, causality is disturbed. It is different from our classical notion of what it should be. But what we have found is that very clearly resembles what we already know from quantum theory. So it seems that if you do allow frames of reference that move faster than light, uh, you have to abandon classical physics and classical notions of causality. But what you end up with is quantum unpredictability or unpredictability of outcomes of measurements, which we, we have shown that this actually a trivial consequence of extending relativity to allow these types of motions. You get, in a very simple way, the need for situations where particles move along more than one trajectory. In fact, this is a necessity. You, you could not have a theory that is uh, classical and involves these frames of reference. You must allow for motions along more than one trajectory at once. And you also get other features of quantum theory, such as complex numbers. Apparently, uh, what we have discovered is not paradoxes, but what we already knew for 100 years. So then the question is, why should we get rid of those eventualities? Why is it necessary for us to get rid of faster than light frames of reference? Well, our answer is that you don't have to. And in fact, if you assume that you can move with any speed you want, as originally intended by Galileo, who invented the principle of relativity, then the consequence of that, logical consequence, is that reality has to be unpredictable, that you have to have motions along multiple paths, and so on and so forth. So we conclude that, or in the hypothesis, is that, in fact, you can deduce some most intriguing properties of quantum theory from just relativity. Right, so uh, 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 we don't yet know what it means. We are trying to figure out whether this corresponds to something more than just uh, like mathematical scheme. Uh, we are trying to figure this out. We have to involve uh, machinery of quantum field theory to predict what are other consequences of that. We are doing that right now. But apparently, all the known problems with extending relativity to faster than light motions are not so obvious. At least, it's not obvious why this should go wrong. And in the spirit of this presentation, I would like to invite you to the talk by Arthur Eckert, who will give you a talk uh, around 1 p.m. yesterday. Thank you.